Hi, everyone. This is Martin Patella, and with me today, Charles Bodie. And Charles comes to me with a very, very interesting story. He and I talked, and we're going to do a bit of a repeat of that because the world needs to know people like Charles. Charles Bodie, welcome to Life Enthusiast Podcast. Well, thank you for having me. It's a true pleasure. I, I also enjoyed our previous conversation. Great. Yeah, it takes one to know one, doesn't it? Yes, sir. We call it meeting agenda, what we want to cover. Did you want to lead in? Why does the yeah. world need to know about what we have to offer? What is the matter with water that people don't really understand? Boy, I'll tell you, that is a deep subject and a wet one, as my dad used to say growing up. Yeah. And uh, the real truth is that water is uh, its something that, you know, makes up 70% plus of our bodies and it's uh, all around us. It's required for health. You know, you, you die without water much faster than you die without food. Uh, air is the only thing that you need more of than water to stay alive and in, in order for us to understand water, we really need to do a deep dive because we've been taught, you know, in school that it's a simple chemical H2O, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, and, and that's it. It's water and, you know, yeah. we got to drink it every day and, and that's about it. But, yeah, uh, water is so mysterious because if it weren't liquid, you really chemically should think of it as a metal. But it's it's anomalous, you know, water defies so many different things. There are so many anomalous features of water that uh, it, it truly beggars belief. Its capacity to absorb heat is uh, phenomenal. Yeah, so the many... magical four degrees centigrade that allows the creatures that live in water to survive in water even when it's frozen. That's right. That's awesome. right. And, you know, we're... We're, we're just taught to, you know, we don't even think about water. It's it's around us. We have to drink it every day. And, you know, that's about it. Some of us that are water enthusiasts, we like to go to the beach or go to the, our backyard and enjoy our swimming pool. But, you know, it's not something we give much, much contemplation to. You know, some people are, you know, paranoid about drinking tap water. So they buy bottled water from the store, thinking that they're doing their themselves and their bodies a favor. And, and then that opens a whole secondary can of worms. But I think for starters, you know, it's it's good to understand that water is not a simple chemical. I mean, going back to the Bible and some of the ancient scriptures from other religions, uh, it says in the very first chapter of the first book, he divided the waters above from the waters beneath. That's before anything was created. If you follow the Genesis narrative, it started with water. And so, you know, recent studies over the last 25 years in physics have uncovered some startling facts about water. There's a, a very brilliant professor. He's the former Dean of Material Sciences at Stanford University, Professor William Tiller. And he posited and then proved that Water is a cage-like molecule capable of storing frequencies and information. So its function is more akin to a liquid crystal uh, as opposed to, you know, a simple, you know, this sterile H2O stuff that we were taught about in school. So it has a memory. Yeah. And I would like to butt in here with I of it as god's memory device well it is it is because it it actually acts as a r random access memory well and, and homeopathy is a witness to this right absolutely that's the basis of homeopathy the capacity to introduce a small amount of a substance into water and the less of it you have the stronger the concentration of the homeopathic remedy is and that's because you're getting closer and closer on multiple dilutions to getting the pure frequency only rather than the substance in the fluid. And then water-based homeopathic remedies have to be percussed or banged to 
reinstitute that frequency of the tiny, tiniest uh, amount of data or information that's in that water for the homeopathic remedy to be functional. I raised my children, myself and wife, we raised our children using homeopathy, that there were no antibiotics or painkillers or whatever's, you know. Oh, did you just uh, have a fall? Well, is this an Arnica fall? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> exactly. Do you, do and in my, my home, we yeah, we no. use both homeopathy and naturopathy. And, you know, for antibiotic effects, we, we, may, we make our own nanoparticle colloidal silver on our counters. And, you know, we rely on a lot of things that are not what I would call pharmaceuticals. Right. And, but with water, you know, going back to this strange substance, this cage-like molecule, we have a few things we've got to deal with. First of all, we've got to filter out the physical particulate. And when we get the water to a pure state, the, we still have contaminated information in our water because we have, a, as you mentioned, it's a, a God's hard drive. It's the, it has the capacity to retain the information of pathogens and toxic chemicals and anything that it's come into contact with, um, pharmaceuticals, uh, anything, you know, the water that comes out of our tap, we often have never considered, and very few of us have ever visited a modern water treatment plant. About 15 years ago, when I began building and testing uh, and studying structuring devices, um, I was friends with the the health inspector in my hometown, I'd given a speech before all of the health inspectors in the state of Ohio, and, and he secured a tour for me of our local water treatment plant in my hometown, which was considered to be, as far as the West goes, state of the art. It was the, you know, very recently built. It was only a few years old, and I got to tour this brilliant water treatment plant. And let's just say it's just close to barbaric. You know, the water comes from the toilets and the sinks and the gutters and the runoff, and it runs to this big processing plant and it goes through a machine that grabs all of the gross stuff that gets flushed down the toilet, the wet wipes and the toilet, thick toilet papers that don't dissolve. They call that the grabber. And it pulls this crud out and then that gets it shuttled and compressed into bins and you know, put in with the solid, the biosolids eventually. And, and then it goes through a series of tanks where they basically chlorinate the ever living crap out of it to try and uh, kill the pathogens to the best of their ability. And then they do have several other tanks where they hope to allow biological digestion to continue after the heavy duty pathogen killing is done. And then when it gets, you know, relatively clear and the turbidity gets, and turbidity is a measurement of opacity, how much you can see through the water. Uh, when it gets to a certain level and it hits the minimum threshold for pathogens, it goes right back into the pipes and right back up into the water towers and goes right back into the people's houses to drink again. Right. Well, I mean, the objective is so that we do not poison and infect the population. That's right. While drinking sewage that's coming out of the town that's upstream. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. And so um, I was just, you know, blown away at the their really lack of like sophisticated knowledge about water. And of course, I didn't mention that here in the States, um, maybe not so much in Canada, but here in the States, they also have a station where they dump in bags of toxic fluoride, of course, you know, to save our teeth. Um, not to mention that, you know, 99% of the water that comes out of a house's water pipes doesn't go in the mouth for toothbrushing. It goes into the gardens, it goes into the sinks, it goes into the showers and the toilets and the baths. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, it's not the kind of fluoride that they used in the tooth studies that were that they leaned on to sell this to the public. It's uh, a byproduct of refining metals and a byproduct of doing um, uh, electrolytic deposition and other things. It's a toxic waste product. So what they've created for themselves is a free EPA toxic waste removal scheme where this poison gets swirled down our drains and they don't have to pay for it. Matter of fact, they get paid to dump it. Doesn't get better. So, 
but that, you know, that is another one of the toxins and, and fluoride. I have some brilliant scientific friends that have been working very diligently to uh, get, get fluoride banned from our drinking water here in the United States. And it is a tremendous neurotoxin. It has proven to cause developmental delays in children and, and it, it doesn't stop just because you're finished growing. It it's, continues to work in calcifying the pineal gland and it has all sorts of other detrimental toxic effects. So one of the things that's super important if you're in the United States to do is filter the fluoride out. Forget about all the other things. The fluoride itself, they add that after it's supposedly purified. Yeah. Well, I mean, yes, 100%. Fluoride does horrible things to us. Uh, chlorine does horrible things to us too. It oh, well, decimates yeah. the decimates the microbes living within us. So and we've got, you know, the the what they call DBPs or disinfection byproducts, which is the the chloramines, the trihalomethanes and and the other toxic uh, byproducts as chlorine interacts with uh, biological matter that are created and those have well documented, you know, toxic poisonous effects. And, um, you know, you had mentioned, you know, what, what, why is it so important to treat the water that comes out of the rest, the rest of our faucets that isn't the water that we drink? And I've compiled a, a rather gruesome list if you're, if you're brave enough to hear it. Sure, let's have it. This is why we're here. We really want to enlighten the audience with understanding just how serious this issue is just a couple of years ago uh, there was a joint investigation that was done by consumer reports and the guardian newspaper in england testing water from across the united states at over 120 locations and the results were were really frightening they found that in over 118 of the 120 uh, locations that were tested there were levels of pfos arsenic, lead, and other uh, minerals that were over the maximum allowable and considered unsafe. And, and those allowable levels are not really beneficial to life. Oh, no, the allowable levels are also too high, you know. Yeah. And in the States, um, we don't really test for, for the forever chemicals, you know, like PFAS and PFOA and and then there's a whole long list of other industrial um, runoff. You know, you have the nitrates and the uh, nitrites from farming and uh, pesticides and uh, irrigation and uh, residual um, fertilizers that are washing away into the, the rivers, the streams and the, the lakes and getting into the water table and, you know, other petrochemical uh, petroleum distillate type of poisons that yeah. enter the water stream and are very hard to remove you know yes my my favorite antibiotic roundup oh oh the glyphosate my goodness yes you know yeah. people uh I, I that's a whole nother show but it's probably responsible for the sickening of the north of north america more than any other thing besides the no-till seed drilling that uh puts mold into the food supply at the same time as it's putting the poison, you know. It used to be when they came out with Roundup, they only sprayed it to kill weeds. And, you know, now, uh, whether your viewers are aware of this or not, they spray it on the crops just two weeks before harvest. So it gets on the fully grown crops and grains, and they do that so that it all gets brown and, and dries out at the exact same time. It used to be... You know, farmers fit their fields over a period of weeks and it would, the you know, the earliest planted crop would dry first and then then subsequent fields, you know, in a rotation as the farmer's time, uh, you know, finished, it would, uh, that's how they would rotate and harvest their crops. Well, now they want to do it all at once. So they come in two weeks before harvest time and they spray this Roundup, this glyphosate on all the wheat, the corn and the soybeans and it dies all at the same time. Then they can set up their, you know, um, geo, geo tracking based 
combines that you know are computer controlled and the farmer sleeps behind the seat and they sit there and they go all over the fields harvesting all of the grains all at once and it saves the farmer a lot of effort i mean the reason why the farmers like it is it, it takes away a lot of their their workload but that means that those poisons have been sprayed right onto the fields. Well, guess what happens when you spray it onto the grain? It gets into the grain. When you spray it onto the fields, as soon as it rains, it runs right into the water table. And then we're back to this subject of contaminated runoff. And it gets into the rivers. It gets into the lakes. It gets into the water stream. It even, you know, poisons the first several hundred feet of the ocean, you know, if most of the fishermen that I know, I live in Florida, they need to go out at least a mile, mile and a half before they'll even think about eating the fish because of the poisonous runoff that they get from the shore. And, you know, when you can affect that large of a body of water, imagine your local small water supply in your hometown. And, you know, it's happening all, all around, all around the, the North America and all over the world. So, they found, you know, lead. Lead is one of the most common contaminants. And, you know, they come from a lot of the old uh, towns had lead water mains. And, you know, they've, you know, outlawed lead in new construction, but that doesn't mean that it's gone from the, the, older, the older towns. Most of the older towns still have these ancient lead water mains running from the downtown square and then as it gets out into the suburbs and the newer areas it switches over to iron or pex or something else but you know yeah. oftentimes to... closest to the source there's still actual lead mains or the old brass fittings that had lead in them before they made the the brass become lead free and it's hor horrific you know it's a, a terrible poison yeah. And we have arsenic, you know, it's another element and it's, it's another super toxic poison. Um, it causes um, nausea, vomiting, you know, it drops your production of red and white blood cells. It can create heart rhythms and damage to your blood vessels. A lot of people that suffer from pins and needles in their feet and their, hand, their, feet and their hands may be suffering from arsenic without uh, realizing it. And, you know, it's, it's more common than you think. In this study that they did with Consumer Reports, they found arsenic was a very common uh, poison found all over. And you know, we, then we've got nitrates, which come from fertilizers and feedlots and industrial waste and food processing. And you know, high levels of nitrite can decrease your body's ability to carry oxygen to the tissues. And so we found, you know, the they say that the number one cause of all of our degenerative diseases today is hypoxia, which is a lack of oxygen in the tissues. And it's, it's usually caused by inflammation, but it, this can be a direct contributing factor, the nitrates that are running off from farmer's fields. And then and you have you know, radon, which is a gas, and you can be taking a shower and get radon uh, coming out in the form of a gas, and that happens due to naturally occurring uranium and, and thorium and radium breakdown in the water, and very few filters do anything to remove the radioactive elements. And so you can be breathing that, that gas in while you're standing in your own shower. And then you've got really, you know, hard, you get into the biologicals, and those are a, a whole another level of, of living things that are active pathogens, some of which can handle the na natural amounts of chlorine that they use um, in our water treatment facilities. You know, things like Legionella can, can swim around in two parts per million of, of chlorine and do just fine. And uh, it, the list goes on and on. You have Cryptosporidium and you've got Campylobacter and E. coli and and these are all often present in the water lines from biofilms that build up along the course of our, our city's municipal water supply system. And then, you know, they've fed and lived there long after uh, the water was treated. So as it's going from the treatment plant back to your house, it picks up these, these pathogens. And, and that doesn't even begin to talk about what's living in your own pipes, in your own house, in your shower heads and things. And you have enterovirus 
and that that comes typically from um, you know fecal matter that goes in this, these sewage treatment plants and and you know they get it down to acceptable levels but that doesn't mean it's gone and you've got giardia and hepatitis and and as I mentioned before legionella and these are all real uh, things novovirus a very common thing also found in this study all these things were found in this this actual study rotavirus uh, another thing that's real common from manure and you've got salmonella which most people know about and shigella and again often these things are related to um were, are related to the sewage treatment uh, plants themselves and so there are there are actually known instances where the these levels were found to be there and the water has been sampled and tested and documented that yes. despite treatment, there you are, Mr. Yes, Sick. I mean, they get it down to acceptable levels when it leaves the plant. But again, there's all these connections and hubs and ju junctures where the water travels through the pipes and they can develop and, and hide out and live in biofilms that build up on the inside of these pipes and these accretions of minerals and, and dead yeah. dead carcasses. Mm -hmm. I'd like to change gears a wee bit. I'd like sure. to get people a taste of how you and why you know what you know. You know, let's just dive into a bit of, well, how did Charles become an expert in water? So I started my career 35 years ago solving water problems. Uh, and, uh, but I am a product developer for a living. So that is the, the fancy 2024 term for uh, an old fashioned inventor. And I have developed products across a range of industries. And I, we first, we developed the product. Uh, I design it. Uh, we test it as a prototype. And then we put it into full-blown manufacturing. And I've, um, we manufacture a complete line of, of ozone equipment, um, sanitizing equipment, and, and then I hold patents for nanotechnology in water, um, something called nanoplasmoid generation and nanobubbles. So I've been at the water thing for a long time. But I started studying the work of a brilliant guy named Victor Schauberger about 15 to 20 years ago. And Victor Schauberger, in my mind, is the second greatest uh, genius of the 20th century that's very little is known about by most people. And I would say the greatest mind of the 20th century was a guy named Nikola Tesla. And the second greatest mind was a guy named Victor Schauberger. In many ways, they were contemporaries in terms of their lifespan. Victor is a little bit younger than, than Nikola. And he was born in Austria. And he became a, a forest warden in the Black Forest at the turn of the last century. And his, he's become the, the father of a science that today we call biomimicry. His motto was to study nature, understand it, and then copy it. And so he was uh, very scientifically minded. And when he was out in the forest, making his rounds, he studied the streams and the rivers, and he made detailed notes of the hydrological cycle. He studied how trout were able to seemingly defy gravity and swim upstream, jumping you know, up waterfalls that would blow a 250 pound man right off of his feet. They couldn't stand in this water. And here these trout are, are virtually flying up, up the waterfall. And he began to develop theories about water that were radical. I mean, they literally set the world of modern hydrology on their head, on its head when, when it was divulged. And he, his first claim to fame was after you know, being this forest warden for 20 years, his baron that he worked for had a, issued a challenge to build a, a, the world's largest log flume. So a log flume is sort of like a chute full of water that kind of looks like the amusement park rides where they have the hollowed out logs and the people ride inside of them and they go flopping down, you know, flowing down a hillside into a body of water and splash at the bottom of, at the bottom of the ride. And what they would do is 
in order to log these forests that were up high in the mountains, they would chop down the trees and then typically they would put them into the rivers and they would go all the way down the rivers and the streams so they got to the bottom of the valleys where the, the wood processing uh, mills and plants were. Well, these deep forests were so far away that the logs would become smashed to smithereens and be unusable. And so the only practical way that they developed to get them out was to build something called a log plume, which is a trough shaped like a, a U sort of, and it would be full of water and they would float the logs down the chute. The problem was this forest that they wanted to, to log was further away than any conventional log plume had ever been built. The high density point for water, right? Absolutely. And he was able to float these logs that were considered to be heavier than water that would not float. Yet in this ice cold 39 degree water, he was able to get enough buoyancy to send him down the chute. And so all of the modern hydrologists that had lost this competition for building this log plume came out and they just ridiculed him. They said, it'll never work. And he said, oh, you're probably right. So he let one of them try to operate it. And of course it didn't work. Then he had the logs removed that they couldn't float. He emptied all the warm water. He filled it up with the ice cold mountain stream water and started shooting, sending these logs. And it was so successful that he attracted the attention of probably the most brilliant European um, hydrological engineer from Germany who became his good friend. And he was so old that he was no longer worried about his reputation in the in, in, because it was established as a, a professor. And he brought him to speak before the hydrological societies of Europe um, expositing his, his theories uh, that he'd come up with. And that became my love affair with learning about Schauberger. And he, he didn't just do log flumes. He, he studied everything about water. He learned that water has this capacity to store information and that in nature, water clears that memory out by swirling the water through vortexes, vortices, and tumbling and cavitating. Um, you know, in modern engineering, we try to eliminate cavitation at all costs because it can be quite a powerful force that can eat up propellers on the back of boats and, and destroy parts. But in nature, cavitation served as a principle of scrubbing and erasing and um, repriming the water to be fresh and full of information. He also discovered that water has a life cycle and it goes uh, much like everything. It has a infantile state, it has an adolescent state, it has a mature state, and it has a, an aged state. And he believed that we should only be drinking water that was from the mature state because water that's brand new, infantile water, new water, that would be like distilled water or reverse osmosis water or rainwater that's just gone through the rebirth in a hydrological cycle is empty. It's starving for information because the minerals have all been stripped out of it during its, its rebirthing processes, steam recondensing in the form of distilled water or rain being born from the evaporation condensation cycle. Um, in the hydrological cycle or, or being stripped of its minerals forcefully under pressure through reverse osmosis. And that has some other negative connotations, but in all cases, it's, it's virtually free of minerals. And so um, it wants to have information. And so if you drink distilled water, it's great for a cleanse, but over a long period of time, it can have detrimental effects. The same has been demonstrated with rainwater and even um, uh, reverse osmosis water has even more negative effects. But um, so, you know, Victor began building devices to simulate um, the eraser, erasure of the information and to uh, then recreate perfect water. And he, he developed many different ways to, to do this, but his research is really just, you know, it's groundbreaking, it's seminal. It didn't just 
start with the water and end with water. He developed devices for energy and he developed all, all sorts of different uh, technologies. Yeah, yeah. What's, what's interesting here, of course, is that this goes against what the scientist, the hydrologist, is taught at school to this day. Absolutely. Right? Like that whole concept became encapsulated and set aside because the engineering mind doesn't understand it. That's right. And they're given a very limited um, needle-like focus in their, in their university training. And then they even let you know that this happens because you, gra you graduate with a degree. And the, my question always is, how many degrees does it take to become a whole? Right? There's 360 degrees in a, in a circle. So if you only have one degree, you're obviously deficient to the tune of 359 other subjects. And this is where we've allowed our, our expert mentality, our expert worship um, to really devolve society in a, neg in a negative way. But he discovered that by cutting the trees down along rivers, we're, we're raising the temperature of our water and it destroys the hydrological cycle. And the worst thing you can ever do is build a dam on a river and they do it all over in order to generate electricity. And that is also incredibly flawed. And Victor proved this because a way to create energy, use, he created a, a way to make energy from a river without doing any damming. And so a very sim simple principle in, in, in hydrology, and they used this in the 1800s to take apart whole mountains when they were mining, is they would take a stream at the top of a hill and they would capture it into a, a large pipe, you know, 10, 12, 14, 18 inches wide. And then gradually they would narrow the pipe, narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower. And when they got down to the bottom of the hill, it would go into a two inch hose. And at the end of the hose would be a nozzle with a, you know, a half of an inch opening. And you would get pressure in, you know, thousands of pound per square inch. And they could just take this water and carve apart hillsides to mine for gold and run all that muddy water into sluices and, and, and pan for free gold with it. Well, that simple uh, principle of reducing the orifice size and increasing pressure, we all know about because we have them in our backyards. Everybody has it on their house. It's called a nozzle for your garden hose. So you restrict the orifice size on your hose and all of a sudden that water that's just you know coming out in a big arc when the nozzle's not on, you put the nozzle on, now it'll shoot across your yard. Well, that principle can be applied to generating electricity in rivers. And that's exactly what Victor Schauberger did. He would constrict the river, force it through a narrow opening, which increased the pressure many hundreds of times. And then he developed a floating turbine that would take the pressurized water. Even more importantly, he created a shunt so that all of the fish and and natural life of the river could go around it and not through the turbine. So it was, you know, nature's not harming nature, not destroying and killing the fish like we do with our modern turbines. And uh, you can do this thousands of times down a river. You can have thousands of bends, thousands of constriction points, thousands of turbines. Open to slow down, narrow to speed up. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, we've, Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm trying to get to you. Tell so in studying all of this, I began to realize that, that everything that I'd been taught about water was essentially a lie. And I began building structuring devices, testing them, and I found the most astonishing things happening. Uh, one of the things I've, I've been uh, in love with for 30 years is electrolysis, the splitting of water into hydrogen and oxygen. And, you know, there is a principle in electrolysis that if you're taking water without any minerals in it or without any electrolyte, it will not separate. It won't split because it won't carry an electrical current. And what I found is by taking distilled water and running it through certain structuring devices a few times, I was able to get that water with no electrolyte, no minerals, to now begin to dissociate and do electrolysis without adding electrolytes. Today in electrolysis, we add catalyst metals to our plates 
if we're trying to split water without adding electrolytes like sodium hydroxide or baking soda or you know, potassium hydroxide or things like that. But I found you could take regular distilled water without minerals and by running it through certain structuring devices a few times, to get that water to split, which told me that everything I'd been taught wasn't true. Then I, I built something called a Brown's gas torch. And I was able to take a 280 degree flame and sublimate tungsten, which has a 10,000 degree Fahrenheit sublimation point. That's turning it from a solid directly into a gas. Now this is 280 degrees is barely hot enough to boil water. Yet here I am taking a tungsten rod, which requires 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit to sublimate and turning it directly into a gas. And I began to realize that water was really something special. And that's when I started to learn about the anomalous nature of water and its capacity to be a heat sink and its, um, you know, capacity to expand when it's frozen, when 99.9% of everything else on earth contracts when it's cold and, and, and on and on and on. And that, that's what led me to the science of, of understanding the science of water, the anomalies of water and realizing that I hadn't been given the whole story at the university and in high school and physics and science classes. So you would you would probably say that the inventor's mind that allows you to think outside of the box allowed you to also see that the box you were in was just limiting and incorrect, yeah? Well, you know, I built my first uh, one of these Brown's gas generators and I did this some of these anomalous things and I, I called my, my cousin up who's a you know, PhD in chemistry. And I told him what I had done. And he said, well, you can't have done that. That's impossible. There. So, well, let me send you a video. It's absolutely not impossible. Here I am doing it on camera. And, you know, it was, it was hard for his conditioned mind to even accept what he was seeing with his own eyes, even talking to his first cousin that we, that grew up very, very close. Okay. We so you, you stripped it apart. Yes. Oh. So I guess what we have is that we have most of the products that we find in our marketplace are made with the education that the person has received through the classic engineering science mindset. And therefore, we don't even know there is a problem. That's right. Yeah. That's right. You know. And I found that talking to these classically educated scientists, if you ask them the right questions, they'll become aware of the problems of their own devices and they'll acknowledge them. But you've got to you've got to lead them to it because at first glance, they hold to what what their original training was. Right. And so, um, you know, and speaking of household water. You know, there was another study that was done at the University of Manchester on shower heads and the water coming out of showers. And the things they found were are just, they're frightening. A lot of the same things that we've, we've talked about, but, you know, skin conditions caused by all these different types of bacteria that live and breathe and breed in the shower head. And, and then the minerals and then the off-gassing I mentioned radon off-gassing and being able to contaminate your lungs. The chlorine off-gasses every single time. And we held it up to the chart and there was four times the chlorine that was safe to swim coming out of the tap. And, and later I, I found out that they were, that chlorine, you know, we think of the smell of bleach as, you know, being this pungent thing. And later on, I found that the chlorine's a, an odorless gas. And so they add that chemical to it so we don't unintentionally breathe it. And so, um, you know, so we know that we're breathing it, you know, so we know that there's a danger. And so, you know, you can be breathing this chlorine and you have no knowledge that it's there because you can't smell it when you're in the shower. You know, uh, some people with a sensitive palate can taste it, but, but smelling it, it's about impossible. And so you're standing there, you have this heated up thing, your pores are wide open, your skin starts accepting it. They found tons of types of fungus that can grow in the scalp. A lot of times skin and hair conditions that have been diagnosed as dandruff or, you know, 
uh, eczema or psoriasis in many cases have been attributed to fungal infections that are, and that people may not realize that one of the biggest sources can be their own shower head and their water supply coming from the tap. Yes, indeed. So where to now? Meaning well, then there's we have, just... we have we have gizmos and gadgets all over, right? We we see water filters, either a pitcher that will remove some chlorine simply, or we have a carbon sure. block that we use. We have the reverse osmosis household filter. We have the water softener that we use to deal with hard water. We have some people with iron in their water, sulfur in their water, yes, calcite and hard water stains all over. I mean, every every part of the continent has different problem, right? That's right. Well, and you know, water softeners. You know, the most common form in in the United States and Canada are the big salt water ion exchanges. Yep. And you know what a lot of people don't realize is in that salt tank it can become a breeding ground for many different types of bacteria. Legionella, I mentioned, it loves salt water. It can swim right around in that tank and breed. And there are many other types. The other thing is they're problematic. I mean, over the course of you know, my 53 years of adult life, I've seen hundreds of them at customers' homes that were broken. And sometimes the house will have not one, not two, but three of those things and two that are broken and one that's working because they're so stinking heavy. There's two or 300 pounds of salt in the tank. And when it breaks, they have the new company come out and install a new one. And no one hauls away the old one. So these garages and basements all over North America are full of these broken saltwater systems. And because it's clogging and scaling. But the other thing is, you know, it's putting in levels of sodium that really aren't healthy into the water. Uh, yes, there's an ion exchange that's happening, but it's not um, it's not the best way to do it. And it can become, uh, again, another breeding ground for for bacteria and getting into the filtration. You know, there are, there are only a few commonly used types of filtration in North America and even globally. And, you know, they, they principally break down into either granular or, or porous based carbon solid block carbon, um, paper filters or synthetic membrane filters. That usually is for chunks, big chunks. And then you've got the reverse osmosis, which is incredibly tiny microscopic pores that it, water is forced through under pressure, typically with a booster pump to squish it through these tiny little holes. And they all have problems. You know, there are some other media, you know, they, the, uh, some of the media that have copper and other things that are in them. That's a sort of a, a newer one, but primarily 95% of all the filters that are sold today, it's just carbon. And you're dealing with granular activated carbon. And one of the latest, biggest, hottest buzzwords is, um, you know, organic coconut whole charcoal activated carbon filters. But the problem with any porous carbon or granular carbon filter is something called tunneling. And tunneling is where the water works its way down through the media and it creates a channel or a tunnel. Yep. And once that channel has been formed, the water will always follow that path. Yeah, the, the least resistance, right? It's the path of least resistance. Absolutely. Water follows the path of least resistance. It seeks uh, the low spot. It achieves its own level. And that those are the always principles of water. And so when you've got these you know, tunnels that have formed, it's not filtering anymore. Then you have solid block carbon filters. Even those can be prone to tunneling. Now, the way carbon works is it has an incredibly vast surface area folded up inside of, of the carbon itself. And it does a really good job of pulling out, especially if you have multiple carbon filters, of taking out the petrochemical distillates, pulling out the chlorine. Um, if you have enough of them, you can eat solid block, you can take out fluoride. But, um, and a big but, people forget that carbon, because of the gigantic surface area, is an ideal breeding ground for pathogens and viruses, bacteria, and fungal spores. 
And so as they begin to filter out the crap, you get organic particulate that builds up in the surface area of the carbon, which becomes an ideal food source for the microbiological and fungal and viral uh, pathogens. And then they start to accumulate and feed on the crud that the carbon filter is pulling out. Now, back 35 years ago when I was 18 and they had these little countertop uh, filters, they were proud to say that they were silver impregnated so that they could not, you know, grow um, bacteria, bacteria. But that's virtually gone the way of the dodo bird. Silver's become a lot more expensive in the last 35 years. The cost of precious metals has skyrocketed. They're being used more and more in industrial um, activities for electronics and other things. And they're, they're, their, their value has increased. And so, so they've eliminated them from the filter media by and large. So, you know, 99% of your carbon filters that are sold today are just carbon. There's no copper, no silver, no antibacterial of any kind, let alone antifungal or antiviral. You're right. So, you know, you can have a water filter and it, it can take out all of your, your toxic chemicals and it can be then introducing you know, the bacteria and the viruses and the fungus right into the water line on the other side. That's a so huge... Here we, are, here we are building up to the big reveal, right? Yes, yes. Well, and so... the big reveal should be having an inventor's mind, having spent 30 years mucking around with these things and understanding that there is a problem, you inevitably decided to do something with it, right? The carpets, the shirts, the fiber, the uh, the yeah. paper straw that you drink out of, um, all kinds of stuff. 45% of our water in the United States is contaminated with this. And these are called forever chemicals because you can't get rid of them once they're in your body. Yeah. And so, or in the soil or any place else. And so this filtration system removes 99.9999% of all of the um, the forever chemicals, everything from DDT to PFOS, PFOA. They came out with one that's supposed to be less toxic called X, which is even more toxic than, <laughs> than the one they were replacing it with. These are du du most of them were created by the DuPont company. Well, that's true. And so I have a brilliant friend because I've been in nanotechnology for the last you know eight or nine years in water. Um, one of my good friends uh, started a novel filter company and his goal and his his business is directly for the to the medical industry so he sells water filters to dentists and doctors and, and uh, surgeons that have in-house surgical theaters because the water that they use for irrigation of the mouth and and wounds um, and surgery has to be ultra pure. It can't have, you know, bacteria or viruses. It'll introduce a pathogen into the body that can create infection and cause death. And so um, many years ago, he engaged the services of a um, Princeton uh, nanotechnology professor, and he developed the base layer of the filters that I use today. And it's, it's a nano ceramic. And he and I have taken a completely different approach to solving the water filter and conundrum. Rather than using these conventional um, porosity based, um, squish the water through a tiny little hole or run it through carbon to get rid of it, we've developed a multi layer solution we call a biodynamic filter, where the base layer is this nanotech with, with an electrical charge, and then each subsequent layer uses electrical charge in a different way. These are permanent charges applied to the layers and we target different things. And the great thing about it, because we're not relying on tiny little holes, it's a very high flow through system. So we can get a huge amount of uh, water volume treated in a very small package. You know, you see most of these whole house systems and they're as tall as I am, you know, these giant five foot tall tanks to, I mean, I'm 5'10", I'm but still, you know, they come up to your nose and they're needing that much to get this 
crud out because it's got to run through the tiny little pores and go through all that surface area where when you're using electrical charge, you can grab far more um, contaminant and use a, a, in a, a lot smaller space, a lot smaller embodiment. And each layer pulls out different things. So the first thing we go after is the biologicals. We want to physically remove the bacteria, the virus, and the fungus. And we want to pull the dead carcass out. You, you may have heard me refer to biofilm during the course of this speech. And biofilm is an accretion, almost like a, a cementitious accretion based on the, the bodies of dead, dead um, bacteria and viruses. And it just builds up and builds up and builds up and it becomes like a cement. Very hard to, to get rid of and very hard. And you have living uh, bacteria that hide underneath this cementitious accretion in the biofilms themselves. And it, they lay down uh, different um, proteins and things to hide and protect themselves from detection and, and eradication. So we're actually physically pulling out the bacteria. We take it out to 10 nines. That's 99.999999999%. And that's about as close to 100% as you can get. Each point on the decimal table is a logarithmic increase. So each decimal point takes top 10 times more than the one before that. We're able to take viruses out to seven nines, seven nines of virus static. That means 99.999999% uh, percent. and you're getting this huge, almost complete elimination of virus and bacteria. And of course the fungus is larger than both and takes all of them out. And uh, that's the first layer. And then after that, we target the, the toxic elements. We're looking at the uranium, the cadmium, the manganese, and we're taking out the iron and the sulfurs. But we want to leave the magnesium. We want to leave the, the, the calcium. We want to leave some of the, the trace um, um, cobalt and copper and things that you need as trace elements for your body. And it's one of the first filtration schemes that's designed to take out the bad stuff and yet leave the healthy minerals that life is dependent upon that we need uh, for good health. And so, but then we, we focus on removing the forever chemicals and it's something we've just barely touched on, but you know, you've got the PFAS or polyfluoroalkyl substances. And these are things that make the nonstick coatings in our pans and nonstick on our, our popcorn bags. And it's just, they're, they're oh, loaded. Yeah. But um, we're able to eliminate the bacteria, eliminate the virus, eliminate the mold spores. We're able to remove the physical carcasses, pull out the toxic elements, pull out the forever chemicals. Our carbon layer is silver impregnated so that we're not getting growth in the filter media itself. And that's one of the important things. Our filters cannot become food for the stuff that we're removing. And then what comes out of there, one would think would be perfect water to drink. But because we're leaving the calcium and the magnesium, you can still have high levels of minerals. So we've got the beginnings of changing the surface tension of the water. And that's something we didn't really discuss yet, which is clustering. So a scientist in the 1970s um, did a bunch of research on the fact that cellular water, the water inside of our cells is very different from the rest of the water. And um, he found that by breaking down the, the clusters in water, you're able to get closer to the cellular water. Now this research was then recently sub resubstantiated by Dr. Gerald Pollack um, author of the fourth phase of water from Washington yeah. University and, and it's been replicated, you know, hundreds of times by s hundreds of scientists around the world. And, and now hundreds of papers have been peer reviewed and published on it. This structured sort of water that can be made by running water through very tiny fibers and tube tubules. And uh, they call it easy water or the fourth phase, but it's very similar to cellular water. So we wanna start breaking up these water crystals. So as the water exits our filter, we're running it through a 10,000 Gauss magnetic field, which is incredibly powerful. Begins to stretch the, the bond angle of the water a little bit, 
break up the clusters. And then we run it past a, uh, start spinning it in a vortex. Now this is the beginning of erasing the information, but this is still part of our softening technology. So we're running it past these catalyst disks. And this was developed in the 1960s, actually by the US military, uh, a salt-free softening uh, technology where we're running past these catalyst disks. The catalysts don't get into the water, they don't get used up, but they do change the, up to 80% of the calcium and magnesium to the crystal form. And in their crystal form, they're still able to be used by biology, but they don't accumulate on the sidewalls of the pipes and in your hot water tank and on your sinks and your toilets and your tubs. And so we've got this salt-free water softening system that has the dual ben benefit of beginning to erase that information. And then the last thing that we do is we run it through what's called a water structuring device. There we recreate the vortices and the cavitation of nature that you find as water tumbles through a stream and over waterfalls. And as we're doing it, we're running it past two biofield imprinting devices. These are so powerful that it creates actual electricity-free ionization as water passes through the biofield and printing. And there are, are hundreds of, of types of um, frequencies that are imprinted into the water of minerals and, and organic matrices that make that water mature, Victor Schauburgerian, healthy water. And we have document, documented studies on crops as diverse as corn to mangoes showing anywhere from 20% to 250% crop yield increases by just putting the structuring unit on the end of a, of a irrigation hose. And you'll get that benefit when you water your own plants and your own flowers and your own shrubs around your home when you have this installed on your water main. And this system is designed to go on the inlet water side of the house before your hot water tank so that you're running filtered water, structured water, softened water throughout every single faucet, every single shower head, every toilet in your home. And now you're no longer breathing it, you're no longer showering in it, you're no longer bathing in it, and you're no longer repolluting the earth by watering your, your plants and your shrubs with it every time uh, you turn the water out of your faucet. And that's the real problem. People try to do these point of use filtration on sinks and their kitchen and they get their little glass from their little thing where they're getting it out of, out of their you know, granular activated carbon or um, solid carbon. And the fact of the matter is it's, you know, just a... I would say that the major issue with that has been cost, right? When, sure. when our cost of filters is significant, and the cost of the filtration system itself goes really big to do the whole house, then you will just say, well, I'm only going to filter the water I drink rather than all the water that I use for my showers and for my garden and for my washing my dog and, and flushing my toilet. Well, and that and a lack of, of, of information. A lot of people don't realize just how bad the problem really is. Yes. So... I unfortunately I'm in a, a borrowed studio here uh, and my time is running up. I don't know what your time is. is well, now. we've been talking too slow, too rich, too much. Uh, well, let's see if we can just drive it to, to some conclusion here in the next two minutes. Sure. Sure. Which is, so there we are. The best candidate for this solution is someone who has their own house because this is not a tiny thing, right? Like you can't right. put it in a condo. That's right. And it is a very small form factor for a whole house uh, structuring, filtering and softening system. I mean- But end to end, it's going to be yay big, right? Yeah, yeah 20 inch tall filters, you know, a, a couple feet of space, you know, eight inches deep to get it uh, installed. Yes. Doesn't fit under a sink. You need a basement or someplace. No, it goes in wherever your city water main goes in before your hot water tank or your tankless uh, heater. And, um, you know, it can be installed. Typically, it's installed by a plumber. But if you are, you know, an adventurous a homeowner, it's not very difficult to, to install the system. Today, we've got these ingenious new fittings called Shark Bite. 
It's almost impossible to find the old fashioned copper fittings that you would sweat with a torch anymore because everyone's plumbing with these, you know, push and click fittings. So you can have a copper fitting and you just push it onto one side, it goes onto a copper pipe and on the other side, it'll go onto a PVC pipe and no glue, no sweat, no mess. It's just like kindergartners can do it. But if you're, if you're not so inclined and you're less brave, then uh, a plumber can install this typically in a couple of hours. All right. So what's the frequency of filter changes on this? You know, for, for municipal water, it's just one filter change a year. They're relatively inexpensive, a few hundred dollars uh, per year to, to have perfectly clean water. If you're on a well system, we recommend that you actually send us a, a water report and we'll design a custom uh, solution and, along with the frequency of changes that are needed. Usually it's only twice a year, but we want to make sure if you have something particularly uh, nasty in your well water that we give you a system that's custom uh, designed to handle that for you. And, and it usually doesn't increase the cost. You might have to add another, another section. Awesome. Well, we will come up with a picture to include somewhere here along the way. So yeah, that, uh, we have some very exciting things coming uh, beyond that. We'll, we're going to have whole house on demand ozonated water. Right after the filter, we'll have a unit that actually uses electrolysis to generate ozone. And we can have you can hit a button on your phone and have ozone water come out of your taps. And we'll have the same thing for molecular hydrogen on demand. And and you know, I we didn't even touch the base that I've you know created, you know, non-toxic uh, chemical free swimming pool systems and um, you know, bat bathing systems that are being used by doctors and hospitals and all sorts of things. But uh, uh, this isn't the only thing that we've ever developed, but it's certainly something that every single person who has a body and a house needs. All right. That, I think, holds it together for us. We will uh, probably have to bring you in one more time to... <laughs> Tell us when it's ready. And maybe, just maybe, people will start writing into us asking, tell me more about this Schauberger story. Or we haven't even started digging into the Tesla story and other bits. No, no, I'm available anytime. I, I, I enjoy you're You're a great conversationalist. And we've, uh, we had a, a great fun our first talk. All right. So we're going to do more of this. So for now... This is Martin Patella for Life Enthusiast and Charles Bodie, our water filter man. We will have this device in the shopping cart. It's not inexpensive. It's for the homeowner who is ready to have a life free of toxins and rich of uh, well, well, water with full information as God intended and uh, clustering that allows full cellular hydration without any fuss, every drop throughout the entire system. Absolutely. Charles, thank you very much for your time. We'll come thank, again. Thank you, Martin. It's a true pleasure as always. Thank you for listening. This is life-enthusiast.com, Martin Patella. If you need to call, it's 866-543-3388. Thank you for being here today.